Good evening. Um, I would like to welcome you to the last panel um, of this first uh, day of the conference. My name is Rusica Gencheva. I teach at the Department of Anthropology of the New Bulgarian University. Um, and uh, I am really glad to be able to present you two Romanian contemporary artists, uh, Stefan Tiron and uh, Ion Dumitrescu. Uh, I'll take the freedom to present them together uh, because they work together um, on common projects. Um, and uh, I'll take the freedom also to present them a little bit longer than usual uh, because what they do is extremely interesting. Um, Stefan Tiron is a founder and co-curator of the Space Agency for Nocturnal Journeys to the Origins of the Universe. Um, he was curating um, science wonder shows from 2006 until two months ago. Uh, and these wonder shows happened in uh, museums, uh, natural history museums, uh, like regional, regional na natural history museums, uh, galleries, private homes, uh, even in clinics. Um, and uh, I will want to read you how one of these uh, sleepovers, actually it's a sleepover, is advertised. It's an event that happened in West Germany, Skaditzer Strasse, on the 1st of June of 2011. And it's called Sleepover Concert Night and Cosmological Knowledge Wonder Show. Uh, what Stefan Tiron uh, wanted to uh, do is reclaim space exploration as an earthly phenomenon. Uh, and that's what the advertisement says. It was always prohibitively expensive and available only to big budgets, trained specialists and national agencies. Nevertheless, today, basically any familiar environment can be equipped with minimal space and time travel requirements. And West Germany will be imaginary spaceship and our base to simulate through sound and a stream of documentaries, new and old. And then he says, our journey on June the 1st doubles not only paradigmatic shifts through pre-Copernican worlds, but also through differing ways of imagining space travel, the origin of our universe, or the history of astronomy. And then they follow uh, short instructions to the audience um, how everybody had to settle comfortably and then the last deep notes will get a Cosmo diploma in the morning. Um, he does uh, a lot of other very interesting performances of uh, uh, which he will tell you himself. Um, Jon Dumitrescu um, is a former, is a performer, contemporary dancer. Former choreographer. Former choreographer. Um, but what he does is that he's interested in post spectacle practice. He does this since 2008. What is post spectacle practice? Uh, it's a practice that proposes different methods of art interventions, media hacking, uh, pseudo political campaigns and multiverse uh, speculations. Um, Jon is asking um, how to perform in a society of spectacle and why. Um, and he says one of the things is that one m might dislocate a performance, that what, his, what he does with the uh, parade, a military uh, parade, like, uh, yeah, that they are invited in a, a dance hall uh, and are observed and enjoyed as, uh, as dancers. Uh, also, uh, a reverse operation, he says, is to infiltrate the big stages of mass media, business and politics 
with the skills, knowledge, and approaches from contemporary art. Um, he does a lot of things, uh, post spectacle in a mall, uh, inauguration of people, Salvation Cathedral. Uh, they're all on the internet, you can watch them, um, they're marvelous. Uh, I just uh, say uh, uh, two sentences about an action called Dorato Action, Pavilion Discredit. Uh, and I give the floor to them. Uh, Pavilion Discredit uh, is an action in the pavilion of Unicredit uh, Bank. They were invited here. Uh, with collaborators were invited to uh, participate, but then uh, the owners of the bank uh, did not like the way uh, they wanted to participate. They felt that they are unwelcome there because what they wanted to say is, is that corporate environments uh, were able to hijack even anarchic uh, arguments. So what they did is that they um, hijacked the event. They pretended the opening is theirs. Uh, and they staged an opening with champagne, uh, claiming that to be invited or cheap, cheap champagne. champagne. <laughs> to be invited or not to be invited for an artist it's a display of institutional power, so they wouldn't care that they're not invited. And uh, what happened was a scandal. Uh, the champagne was thrown out. They were also thrown out. Um, but Jon Dumitrescu concludes, a scandal is a moment when something is revealed, something burst publicly. It's a context in which the hidden or unconscious power relations become visible and important, a moment of the real when things are exposed. Um, I now give the floor to Stefan Tiron and Jon Dumitrescu. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> we will not go into specifics. <laughs> but uh, just before we start, I just wanted to say, uh, like together we really enjoy being here in Bulgaria. And um, <clears throat> one of the many things that I enjoy uh, about the Bulgarian culture is, <clears throat> as a musician and producer, I've been uh, lately, together with my colleagues from Future Nuggets, this is my label, uh, very much studying and following the, the Kuchek scene here, the orchestras, like, uh, which for me somehow is like a very futuristic music, <clears throat> which is consumed somehow still obscurely here, but. So I just want to give my love to Bulgaria and the Kuchek. <laughs> what, what, what kind of music is it? <coughs> well, check it out. It's also here in the region, right? Yeah. There is a and this region is uh, like, has a specific type of Kuchek also. Uh, so yeah, should we put the lights on? Yeah. Can we put the lights also in the audience and also here? But watch. You okay? okay. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, sound. Is it somehow ringing in your ears? The one that destroys the ears of the Americans. Yes. Uh, maybe you heard about this uh, issue they had at the uh, American Embassy. I really wanted to come out with this kind of thing uh, here, because we are here at the uh, American uh, University. And uh, practically, as members of the Zero Department, we wanted to claim this sound. It's actually a product of ours. Uh, of course, it was very, very obscure, and Such people have been researching into it. There were uh, entomologists being brought in uh, uh, by the CIA, and they kind of tried to figure out what type of sound it is. 
and they said it's actually just insects. It's actually just a cicada. Do you know cicadas? Yes. Yes, and they kind of, you know, it's like a signature sound of the summer. It's also one of the most powerful sounds in nature. And uh, strangely enough, Yes, and it's strangely enough associated with another phenomenon called Cicada 3301. If you know this, maybe you're not familiar with this. It's a sort of very obscure organization, apparently, that tries to protect the people from teaching them cryptographic techniques and so on. You can also research into that, but that has been also accused of being a cult, a religion, and a mode of recruitment via these kind of disclosures that they make and uh, associated with this kind of symbol of the Tsikala. Okay, you can just research further on, you know, and draw your own conclusions afterward. So, now, I wanted to, to, to begin my little uh, presentation. So, No God in Cosmos, here is the actual book. This was a 1985 Five. anthology of texts written by both Eastern European sci-fi writers from the whole kind of Eastern Bloc and Romanian included and also Western. And it also had a kind of Galactica introduction in a sense of paying some sort of lip service to the primary function of uh, demonstrating that basically there is no kind of surveillance up there. And, and you know, that you could also enjoy finding out that there is no God. That there is no God, exactly. Um, so this panel started as an atheist or atheist sci-fi panel with a head-on task of secular world building that socialist and communist sci-fi took on so seriously as an important and essential part of its legitimation and role in the new society. Indeed, this noble task has been beset by various hardships, conundrums and given rise to new post-secular hybrids and metaphysical outcomes. I've set myself an impossible task to try and hide in plain sight. Last couple of lectures I've been doing out of a black box. A big black painted box of discarded carton for home appliances where your last smart Samsung fridge got transported or the last model of spherical mini UFO wash machine got delivered to your house, I decided to take the place of the goods go dark in a simple, banal way and switch places with the internet of things that speak, that speaks and speak via a mouth hole made in the box. This was a wayward way of embodying the black boxing glory hole that goes on at the level of opaque algorithmic happenings, the possibility of manifesting or talking about escaping capture, surveillance and total subsumption under capitalism by confining myself to the empty spaces that it left behind. Because everybody has been spaced, as in ejected in the cold of outer space, or has been evacuated from thinking inside the box, and yet the box may be entirely or almost empty. As Ion Dumitrescu here aptly pointed out at some point, I'm going to demystify and reveal something I haven't revealed to anybody before. Even with the risk of alienating and mystifying you even more than before. I choose to do this in a particular context, in this particular context. Because of the depth I feel towards my Bulgarian friends, colleagues and hidden masters. 
practically my whole childhood, youth, teenage years, was spent spying on Bulgarian neighbors. <laughs> you probably know that Romania was transforming into basically a prison planet during the 80s. It clamped down on any outside import, cultural or otherwise. It was of great importance to me that most of the pop culture documentaries and movies that came via Bulgarian TV channels uh, was essential, if you had the proper antenna. This isolationist position within the socialist bloc was also compounded by a bizarre reversion to paleo-nationalist conservatorism and reactionary pro-natalist biopolitics. <laughs> The outcome wasn't at all what was expected, but a gradual opening to the languages such as Bulgarian, that even though Slavic became necessary to get access to the TV pop cult. No. Nobody had a proper antenna. So you had to improvise, which resulted in countless anecdotes about trying to manually fix the wire on top of your TV or the saucer, on top of your balcony, or balancing on the roof of the block to communicate with the family below and tune in to the Bulgarian channels trying to catch the right configuration. Basically, this entire exercise of tuning into the Bulgarian TV was akin to the cathode ray mission where Professor Brian Oblivion, the pop culture analyst and philosopher, would only appear to on television and where homeless people are provided food, shelter and clothing and encouraged to binge watch TV. The result are a clear ending up with a new flash. The broadcast signal becoming mythified, arousing new sensation and growing new disturbing organs. Here is my cue to introduce myself as a product misshapen by Bulgarian psychotronic control, a renegade agent returned to its initial home base. Studio Hicks was probably the first late night show program that mind melted me and others and scared the shit out of me and also gave me the first horror sci-fi thrills while watching a serialized Bulgarian dub version based on the 18. 97 Invisible Man by H.G. E. Wells. Now that this is behind my back, I can move ahead. I'm here in front of you, but I'm not who I appear in the program. I'm not actually a member of the University of Arts in Bucharest. If you're interested in my affiliations or institutional hideouts, we can discuss later. In the break, I will be happy to oblige. But I've been constantly been a member of the Zero Department. During the last 10 years or more, I have been working as a sleeper agent, together with several other collaborators or ex-members of one of the most reclusive, impossible to trace branches of the infamous Securitate. We have basically used a whole plethora of fabulations, online and offline memes, spy scares, confessions, double agent witnessing, and hyperstitional dimensions of Zero Department to infiltrate, confound and take on higher inhuman entities, aesthetic creatures, Leviathan swarm beings of an entirely different scale. Such entities can well and should be entirely, uh, could be entire culturally imperialistic blockbusters or mono pop floods, monstrous trashy becomings of brainless sci-fi, constant rapture of vengeful nerds, singularity universities, and the dry dreams of Elon Musk, Ready Player One Geek Inquisition, and its nerd exploitation torture sessions. In this case, I wouldn't like to over theorize or emphasize the relations with the Zero Department and its marginal fringe role within the sci fi fan clubs, uh, or how writers connected with the Zero Department cycle of stories and sightings are positioning themselves in regard to sci fi or conspiracy theory or recent history at large or well known turning points. I would just like to give concrete examples of my involvement with others under the umbrella 
of its ample speculative breadth. Suffice to say, even today, there is a psychotronic version of the 1989 events, the only explanation able to explain the shootings and general outbreak of sudden revolt is psychotronic devices placed in particular locations able to influence the masses. You may be familiar with a similar version, a solar punk version of inflamed bodies and minds coinciding with cycles of solar bursts and coronal revolt by the heretic solar activity thesis of heliobiologist Alexander Chichevsky. Uh, we've tried to make up some stories, urban legends and self-fulfilling prophecies true. I will take just one example. I have several, but there is no time and maybe it's better so. Uh, there is a category of books that defies general borders and doesn't even react or budge when specialists and professionals, such as the ones present here, will try to exclude or send them to the burning hell of pulp toxic theory. These are books written under the pretense of being true witnessing or confessions of actual happenings where names were changed and persons protected. Let's pretend they could be books by, written by ex-former secret service, military or ex-military, or pensioner ex-military who got bored, who actually enjoyed their work, or who basically transformed their free time into a job, and the job into a hobby during their free time. Uh, uh, they, our hypothetical authors, are those who have been collectively created, who have collectively created a corpus akin to the Arthurian cycle, or a cycle of secret service sci-fi real-life confessions recounting their days in the mysterious Department Zero. To put it short, based on Radu Cinamar's accounts in his book, The Torku Cap de Mort, Future with a Skull, uh, yeah, uh, this Department Zero in the beginning of the 80s had invited Chinese experts specialized in identifying psi powers uh, and finding children with paranormal capacities and recruiting and training them into the ranks of Ceausescu's most obscure and last resort way to combat the encroaching capitalist forces of containment and the centripetal forces of inner dissolution. In fact, Ceausescu did say capitalism will only then win out when trees will bear impossible fruit. He was publicly quoting in his April thesis no, July. July thesis uh, at the uh, Congress. Yeah. Uh, again, um, you said it in uh, Romanian, the, yeah. the, the, this yeah. proverb, mm -hmm. când uh, rachita face pere și um, rachita, ah, când plop face mere și rachita micșunele. Micșunele. He was publicly quoting an old peasant dialectical saying, uh, about the impossibility of gathering one species of fruit from a completely different kind of tree, say strawberries from a willow tree. In fact, zero department seems to never be concerned by mere mortal foes or human antagonists or even by the idea of antagonizing somebody who is well beyond the pale of earthly matters. Shifting objectives, objectives have been invoked inside all the papers regarding Zero Department having to do with guarding the Earth against outside invasions, metaphysics, alien conquerors, or even getting to attract them on our side, or investigating the maze of tunnels under the Buchej Mountains, part of the Carpathian Mountains arc, especially under the non-human Sphinx, and Babele complex communicating directly with Agartha, Tibet, or Rilia. In 2007, together with Zero Department member Alexandra Koitoru, who couldn't attend this conference, we presented the first preliminary report on the use of psychotronic weapons of mass destruction akin to the commission that basically didn't find any reasons to invade Iraq, <laughs> having his results twisted around and modified. We basically used Radu Cinamar's book and actually took its proofs, suspicions and allusions and actually produced all the analysis work, the missing proof and even a bibliography and field work necessary as a result of a long research and residency in the region. To date, our initial report on psychotronic weapons had have been feedback looping and strange looping into a very milieus that have originated and circulated the Zero Department stories, into the forums of Secret Service members, 
the grapevine and their networks of dissemination. As such, we have proven our allegiance to the Zero Department. Thank you. Yeah. This is basically it. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I now give the floor to Ion Dumitrescu, who will speak on science fiction and the production of alter metaphysics behind the Iron Curtain. Thank you, Stefan. So I will uh, dive straight into the subject. <coughs> um, I will uh, just have to mention before that this is like a line of thought, like a speculative uh, chronology on the function of science fiction or if and how it worked or how it replaced uh, or contributed to the meta, meta notions, the meta that were, let's say, like uh, the production of metaphysics that the communist regimes and Soviet Union were uh, somehow had to do it to replace um, God and monarchy, which is the same thing. Uh, so, so we will um, consider science fiction roles in the production of Beyond um, and its contribution to manufacturing new meta foundations or other meta goals incubated by communist regimes in Eastern Europe. Aspirations principal pillars of an ungraspable telos that would co coagulate the collective subjectivity, the meta-glue that keeps society together parallel to the proletarian struggle meta. <clears throat> so we're interested in to see what function science fiction performs, seen as a generator of metaphysics, projecting alternatives to the pre-critical absolute of orthodox Christianity or other monopolytheisms. So it's like overcoming mysticism through tales of deep space. Um, <clears throat> we, re uh, we, we regard science fiction literature and movies in general as non-systematic creators of meta, typologies of meta, a variety of ideological and ontological mutants or tabloid meta, sens sensationalist netherworlds and super beings, a bridge between primitivism and modernism pre-critical and critical. Science fiction as pulp can afford not to be serious while philosophically performing a very serious function to transform or remove religious monarchical metaphysics by speculating upon new foundations grounded in positivism and science. <clears throat> so, science fiction in the common sphere was also adventurous and playful asking both old and new fundamental question, charting the unknown. And here I would just have to mention the uh, conceptual artist uh, Julius Kohler and its uh, work, Art Installation Universal Futurological Observatory, in which he incept, which uh, is uh, from 1971, <clears throat> and which we, he set up a landing site on a former tennis court in order to wait for another truth to arrive. Czechoslovakia. Yeah, Czechoslovakia. So it's like waiting for another truth to arrive is like, but not from the West. So preferably from cosmos. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I was thinking to go. Okay. So cosmists were looking, so pre revolution. Cosmists were looking already deep in space, experimenting with unfamiliar subjectivities radi as radiant mankind, proto-transhumanism, life extension, trying to tackle problems of future dwellers, long after the success of the revolution have produced a scientifically and ideologically driven society. So pre-revolution, Russian cosmists and the art avant-garde we're trying to invent for the post-revolutionary world a meta-frame, both political and aesthetical, an alter universe propelling ideas and aesthetics that would blast off humanity out of capitalism and God orbits. According to Fedorov, if revolutionaries from all ages were to be resurrected, the colonization of other planets would become a matter of logistics, essential to any revolution. But what I'm trying to say is that 
in order for the success of the revolution, you need radical shift on many levels. So, actually, there was a need for a new prehistory, a change on an abstract level. A much more fundamental shift was required in terms of perception, art, architecture. How does the world would look like after the death of the figurative? Suprematism, for example, <clears throat> Malevich. So what other meta-structures have to be breached, replaced, radically challenged in order for the revolution to be successful? The vertical old meta, the religious and monarchical, was put on horizontal by the revolution for a new sky cosmos to emerge, clear of gods, the assault of heaven, it was today mentioned, just the heaven to like free the heavens from gods, Stop the heavens. make room for the unknown, I would say. <clears throat> so for me this is also interesting, because this is one of my uh, <clears throat> uh, current um, obsessions. Uh, prehistory and like uh, seeing the today's world as a prehistory, so it is like a pre-concept so in order to somehow uh, overcome the post. This kind of feeling that we're constantly living in an agonizing end. So there's like, when do we leave postmodernism? So it's like this. And so I, I came up and it's like a text here in this book, Black Hyperbox, which is and it's, the text is called Pre. So just pre, and I'm trying to speculate about this uh, new prehistory emerging. <clears throat> so I'll try to make like a speculative chronology of the different functions that science fiction had in this, let's say, from the start of the revolution till the 89th, from, from 1917, 1918, from the early period of Soviet Union to the last period of Soviet Union, but not only. So the <clears throat> The speculative function of science fiction within the socialist sphere of Europe drastically changed in time and can be roughly divided in three periods, from performing utopian duties to critical dystopian projections. <clears throat> so, like, what kind of meta-narratives have science fiction produced during this long 20th century period? So, one, the early stages, the first period, the early stages of the Soviet Union, when science fiction was imagining the colonization of other planets, extending the revolution beyond Earth, but also exploring space out of an imminent human curiosity, decorrelated de de from religious or capitalist narratives, but never decorrelated from the human. <clears throat> Talking about Tsiolkovsky and the perfection of man. So, I would just, we should note the difference between socialist brand of modernism, inconceivable outside the progress of man, and the contemporary final stages of neoliberal modernism that can, can completely evacuate human agency. So, the first period was the one was, you know, very looking out in deep space, thinking of spreading the revolution. The second period was the space race, the space race euphoria of the 50s and 60s, the consecutive successes of Sputnik and Gagarin, when space program was heavily used also as a propaganda tool, but also the most optimistic communist age, the period of relative stability, when Eastern socialist society were for a while basking in a hopeful ambience, despite, or rather normalizing, the Cold War nuclear menace, when the state-run metaphysical apparatus apparatus seemed to work. <clears throat> that was the time when movie, science fiction movies were addressing philosophical, became, the function was a philosoph they were asking philosophical questions through Ostrogatsky, I mean Solaris, and of course uh, they're the most obvious examples, but this is a moment when uh, science fiction scenarios and actions were taking place in stable societies, where, where the concern was now about consciousness, about the you know, human limits. Then from the 70s on, the third period, I would speculate, uh, was when the dystopian scenarios started to be sketched. Bleak narratives of the future assembled from ominous symptoms of the present. For example, conceptual artists in the Eastern Bloc, Czechoslovakia, Poland, USSR, began 
began using outer space as an escape route, a getaway, culminating with Ilya Kabakov's installation, The Man Who Flew Into Space. So by the 80s, the cosmic dreams ended up being the only, by now symbolical, outer place to escape. The macabre science fiction movies of the 80s, which conclude with visit of a museum. It's like the end image, end image of this transition towards dystopian, dreary visions of times to come. So, in a way, from this kind of aspirational uh, scenarios and some that science fiction was producing, it ended up in the 80s, some, as I feel, in a sort of very producing only dystopian, bleak landscapes with no aspiration or metaphysical challenges, like everything was failing. <coughs> so, should, should I? Yeah. <coughs> One of the, in this, like, I'm, I'm trying to mention a bit the production of uh, metaphysics in the communist era, like some ideas, which I, what do I mean? What kind of production? So, production of solidarity. Like, how to sustain solidarity. So, this would be one of the, which I call meta, metaphysics, but maybe just, you know, meta, pop, meta. The thing that would coagulate society, some, like solidarity. So, this is one of the production of metaphysics that I think at some point also failed. So besides economical productions, I think it's a solidarity, this kind of metaphys metaphysical failures in production. So the, the, the fight between the communist type of modernism and the capitalist type of modernism. This was also like a fuel constantly during the years to keep up population and like we are united in this goal to prove that our type of modernism, our type of rationalism, Modernism is somehow will prevail. But I will have to choose a particular production of metaphysics, uh, and now, <coughs> which you are also very familiar, uh, talking about the, this institute, the Primatology Institute in uh, Sukumi, which is in Georgia, Abkhazia now, um, and which was founded, among other scientists, by Ilya Ivanov who um, was a primatologist ex er, who did really er early experiments, as you probably know, and with hybridization, the human the human Z hybridization. So uh, monkey-human hybrids. He was the first trying and imagining to do, and he, he they uh, um, founded this institute in the 20s, I think, which is still going miraculously today. It still has 6,000 monkeys. And it's like the biggest colony of monkeys and they still do some very uh, cruel experiments. There's a very nice uh, documentary movie which appeared last year. I will show you an excerpt from it at the end. Um, which deals, but I think this Ilya Ivanov, it was constantly, and he also had to defend that his hybrid, that this project is not hiding an atheist subtext. Uh, at some point, although it was clear that making a new entity, making a new being, was clearly an act of defying any kind of God, uh, it still wasn't so popular and he had to defend by the 30s because the experiments were kind of uh, very rudimentary still. So he had to defend. <coughs> but. Um, <laughs> it also exhibited uh, this morning, uh, how to say, like, like uh, uh, the con contradictions between Eastern and Western atheism, in the sense that he got a lot of support by this kind of racist, uh, eugenist American atheists that basically also sustained the project, but somehow they refused the money and the funds for this kind of support. So, yeah, the time. but of course it's always interesting to speculate if Ilya Ivanov would bring this kind of new being that you can control, which is not fully, is like a 
a sort of an epsilon being uh, would be used as a universal worker. What function would you give? Would become the universal soldier, universal. Hero? And I was thinking now that in the eighties, Romania was famous for its for its uh, gymnasts, if you remember, and actually from the seventies. And in a way, what uh, the Italian regime produced is kind of the most disciplined body in the world, <clears throat> and this for Romania became a new meta. Everybody was obsessed with Nadia Comaneci. And Nadia Comaneci became sort of universal soldier. That everybody was like, you know, having confidence in the regime that at least it can produce this kind of body. The most disciplined, the one that never fails, never cracks, and has 10. I mean, the score is 10, 10, 10. So in that 80s, then it was all this grounded on uh, gymnasts. And, Failing with the hybrid, but Some escape the West, uh, the and, then, and then they escape and the trainers. <clears throat> um, I would like you to read a few comments on this last uh, science fiction movies of the Soviet era. Visit uh, of a museum by Konstantin Lopushansky. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Visit of a Museum was the last science fiction movie released in the Soviet era. The post-calamity world depicted strangely resembles the immediate future view upon the East after the Iron Curtain collapsed. As if Lopshansky was preparing the visual and conceptual frame for the imminent dismantle of the socialist bloc, foreseeing the future no longer science fiction. In the movie, the main group of inhabitants are a degenerate, quasi-religious segment of the population, the ones upon which radiations had the unfortunate effect of drastically lowering their IQ. A population of primitives with atrophied cognition, guided by primary effects, desperate but true, honest, socially de declassed by a nuclear event, involuntary epsilons in a coward new world doing the dirty jobs of the normal, civilized person, housekeepers of the genetically lucky ones. In the movie Image, the humanoids, mutants, dwell in the reservation, a confined area that could function as a future mirror to the Vars Varsal Pact perimeter. The socialist camp seen here by the main character through the shattered windows of a devastated but still functional tram train taking the impossible public transport to the shores of an irradiated ocean. The crumbling infrastructure, the intense precarity, the all-engulfing dirt and filth, fragments of an image to be discovered by the West after the collapse of the Iron Curtain. The visit of a museum projects just a slightly more amplified vision of the quasi-evolved East, a caricatured rendition of a general ambience to be revealed after 1989 in Romania, Bulgaria, Georgia, Ukraine, and other new countries detached from the USSR encapsulation. The analogy with communist Europe, Europe was barely veiled. <clears throat> the demented mutants were hardcore religious, pious subjects, using a drastically simplified, even darker version of Christian orthodoxy, with only one prayer, let me out of here. While riding the hell train, sitting one next to the other, the normal homo sapiens asked the mutant, what do you mean, let me out of here, from the reservation? The mutant replies in a catatonic state, not just the reservation, but in general. In order to enter the temple, to see the pseudo priests, one has to knock on the door and shout the prayer as many times necessary until the doors open. So, I would, the last generation of science, so I'm going now just to end it, the last generation of science fiction movies produced in the communist realm, see also Obioba, The End of Civilization by Piotr Slukin, 1985, was producing metaphysics no more, just bleak, bleak nowhere lands and nightmare worlds, a cyberpunk analogy with worth a look. As if by the 80s the zone would have expanded to the whole iron behind the iron curtain. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah.
I just want to show you now uh, the fragment from um, the, the movie, it's called Tarzan's Balls. It's, uh, we have written like a piece in Romania about it. Yeah. Ah. если я посещаю церковь, там, ну, до, к сожалению, недостаточно так и часто по своим вот ощущениям, я не раз не разумею, как раз это так и получается. The director of the institute for the past 50 years talking with their new employees, researchers. На мой взгляд, что это, это вполне совместимо в том плане, что, на мой взгляд, что религия это совершенно другой мир. Шла эволюция эрозии, независимо от Бога, или сказать, что Бог создал человека. Вот сказать, что конкретно вот теория Дарвина, вот это только есть, а другое все неправильно или наоборот, а я считаю, что это абсурд. Все. А что другое все? Что? В плане вот религиозного. Бог создал человека, и Бог имеет э, э, подобие человека. Так вы тебе представляете? Вы знаете, как совсем не что такое Бог? Я в виде человека. А так совсем, если мы верим в Иисуса Христа, то мы верим в то, что мы подобны Господу. Что... А теория Дарвина как? Теория Дарвина это теория Дарвина. Мы ее проходим, ее учат в школе, а у меня поэтому... Молодежь так разделяет это. Это тоже не все. Да, я не верю в то, что я в прошлом была обезьяна. Что теперь будет? Но ваши предки. Я сама была удивлена, когда писала диссертацию. Был обзор у меня обезьяна как лабораторный двойник человека. И когда столкнулась с тем, что такое колоссальное сходство, просто сумасшедшее сходство между высшими обезьянами и человеком. Но тем не менее, уже будучи как бы. Христианка, я Вы раздвоились. Я как бы писала об этом, я понимаю, что в моем представлении обезьян тоже созданы, ну, как бы, они созданы для того, чтобы а, мы имели своего двойника, имели возможность экспериментировать. Ну, об этом можно долго говорить, и на это да. не уйдет одна минута, и не две, и не ну, пять. То есть я поняла, что вы все-таки разделяете Совершенно. Да. И, и считаете, что могут сосуществовать? Ну, да, и другая же, теория. Я, да. Думаю, уже все равно. Да. я просто имею свое четкое представление о том, как я это. Не верю в теорию, да. Не так кажется. Да. Окей, Да. Sorry. So uh, the old lady was uh, is was running the institute, the, uh, the primatology institute of Sukumi in Georgia that I was mentioning. She was running for the past 45 years. So the old lady, so she's like, and the new, uh, no, it's not online, but I can pass it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Jon. Uh, now the floor is open for discussion. It's it was a very nice surprise at the conference. I think it's a very good thing to conference. Thank you very much. But I wanted to now clarify a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, again, thank you very much for this very nice surprise at the end. Thank you, Stefan, for your, uh, your text. It's wonderful. You're very interesting in a different way. But I wanted to separate a little bit for us facts, analysis, and then other learning mechanisms such as humor and afros and stuff. So what part of your presentation will not facts that you have studied, and what part of your presentation will not get afros and fabulous and such? Because they're kind of blurred in a way, but like, we'd like to hear at least me. In my case, I mean, in my case, this is uh, what I've been interested uh, 
in the past year. Yeah, I mean, for me it's like very clear production method. I'm trying also to decipher and to see it and what um, <clears throat> I'm also interested into the technicalities of the production of metaphysics, the little details and the routine. And, I mean, there's a lot of things. So in my case, if metaphors appear, they are only to just better serve the concepts and the instruments that I'm trying to build now. It's quite difficult to disentangle it. But, uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> I also have a part, like a, a, a more, I, I don't know how to call it, like a more theoretical part, let's put it this way. Uh, actually, I brought some exemplaries of this booklet that I've been publishing. I mean, with a. Uh, uh, I like a, strongly recommend. Uh, strongly. Yeah, it's very bad. Uh, how to say, like, bad English, like, kind of not uh, edited correctly and so on. But uh, it has this kind of uh, research or uh, more into the, the, the kind of sci fi studies, let's say, but. Uh, also like speculative realism or philosophy and uh, so on, but uh, and especially dealing with uh, generational arcs and kind of impossibility of re-entry on Earth or re return on a weird Earth. Uh, th this is like a sort of uh, main kind of, uh -huh. and it also mentions some of the texts that were. Uh, like written from the stars, uh, some, some, some of it. And talking about uh, the zero department, the zero department. Has Can I say a few words? Yes, please. Because I mean, in a way, uh, why is it so impossible to disentangle? You know, besides humorous and uh, other uh, what may sound anecdotal or insane, actually they do play a part. They do have a function. So whether we can really trace them and make them into hard facts is not very relevant because they already all this uh, atmosphere of paranoia conspiracy they did uh, have a function and somehow they like they, they participated in the dynamics of a mental ecology in Romania but I also want to say that I kind of told I mean I, I kind of uh, exposed th these kind of things because I also get a bit bored or I don't know disgusted by it in the sense that it's become the norm. I mean, you know, in the post-truth kind of universe of trolling or whatever you want to call it, you know? This was kind of pre <laughs> in this sense before this kind of, you know? And more, I don't know, like uh, performative in a sense. And uh, I have to say that, that we took very seriously this kind of uh, materials that themselves are kind of very toxic and some of them really difficult to read i i have to say like it's 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 a most you know like like a terrible kind of uh, literature i mean you, you know the, the kind of pro uh, cognitive protection so but, but every it's also been kind of appropriated in many ways in many 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 ways and always comes up, always comes up. And it's not just because we kind of fed into it. Uh, it comes in, I just give you a very small uh, context. You know, from the media, you know, there was some sort of van placed at the protests now in Bucharest with the resistance on, and everybody said, look, look at the antennas, look at the, it's them, it's ta -na 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 -na, and this kind of developed. Or, Raelian meeting in the hotel in Bucharest where I was present also and uh, it wasn't as a zero department member but somebody in the audience was getting up and was talking as if you know and talking to the Raelians who were kind of uh, establishing this kind of alien embassy on earth and making uh, um, how to say bap baptisms for the ambassadors <laughs> and these guys kind of brought in there, uh, you know, like uh, said, ah, but what do you think the zero department would 
think about this, you know, like our, you know, uh, it's, it's really, also you can go well into the kind of invented tradition, kind of Eric Hosbaum uh, thing, because Romania was also having this kind of invented stories in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, kind of building this kind of national identity. And one of the examples that kind of obsessively comes is the tablets, the lead tablets from Sinai. I just give you an example. This is not made. This is, we didn't make this. But apparently, it was made by the, some kind of group of inter intelligentsia from that time, kind of uh, mysticoid, uh, esoteric kind of movements, Golden Dawn, this kind of thing in Romania, and they produced these tablets that are a pseudo-historical proof of the continuity. I don't know in the in the regions that you know there is some sort of you know asterix uh, situation in Romania where they were not conquered by the Romans or you know this kind of. Huh? But they really look formally really interesting because they are kind of a collage, the, the works. They took from, and they put together, they invented the writing, saying it's kind of some, uh, I don't know, like hieroglyphic writing, but it's really like this kind of thing. And of course, this has been also kind of regurgitated and recycled inside this kind of universe. You know. I, I'm not so systematic in the sense that I'm always coming up with this kind of zero department story, you know. Uh, it depends. It depends really on different contexts, like uh, why and how and uh, if it works and if it works better here or in Geneva or who knows, you know. Uh, but I, I had always like this kind of, you know, this is one, one example that I wanted to, to show I didn't get to. Meta contact, I don't know. Meta what? Meta contact. Ah, for Narev Dimitri Nikolaevich. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, I mean. Does have uh, No, it has this kind of very coherent kind of justification for the role of the secret service, but from a metaphysical kind of level. Former <coughs> KGB. But also, kind of uh, uh, president of the bodyguard association in, uh, uh, in, in Russia. So from the time of Belzo, like he's really, huh? And somehow we got invited into Romania. The cover is made by a contemporary artist, which I don't understand. I mean, I've been trying to ask him why he, or how he managed to have make this cover, uh, and. Uh, he, it's very plainly and openly kind of discussed and how he got invited on the train, how he came to this city coming from Russia. It's like really incredible uh, piece somehow, but also impossible to read, I must say. Looks <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, yeah, it's very, really hard. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so, okay, so the Zero Department framed this, uh, this, uh, this conversation as uh, no God in the cosmos. And in, in Jon's talk, I really understand uh, how you're talking about the sort of uh, mutations that mysticism undergoes uh, through the vehicle of science fiction in, um, in the socialist period. But Stefan, I wanted you to talk about that a little bit. Maybe it's obvious, but I want to hear it articu articulated. What is the relationship between this kind of paranoiac and conspiratorial um, uh, mode of forming narratives and, uh, and, and this kind of vacuum of theology, because I'm, I'm thinking of like, like Sergei Nilus and the, who published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in, in Russian, and for him that was like a Satanist tract, a Satanist treatise. Um, and there's something, I, my question is basically is, is conspiracy theory also a kind of sublimated mysticism, um, or is it? Uh, is it? Does it reproduce the theo a, a kind of theological knowledge system or belief system? Does that question make sense? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's so in a way, it, it might replace. It might have this function. Yeah, you can speak to this too. But it might replace. It might have this function. You know, the religious, but I think it also feeds from um, um, frames in, from the religious. So it uses, it feeds from the religious. Uh, I don't know if it has the 
function of replacing the vacuum, but certainly it uses the uh, theoretical frames or you know, belief frames. I also didn't, didn't mention this. I mean, also wanted to get back a bit, re rewind a bit, that all the part that I said about Bulgaria is on. Uh, is okay. Uh, the, 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 the discussion about this, I was also interested in how this kind of sci-fi, I mean, it bleeds into the contemporary politics in Romania specifically. For example, the guy who published this, uh, his, sorry, one of the most famous uh, kind of publishers, Alexander Mironov, maybe you heard of him. Uh, and he became a minister, you know, after 89, minister of tourism. And it was really interesting to kind of see this kind of shift from news, like 8 o'clock news, and 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock alien dissections into, uh, you know, on, on, on TV uh, discussing. So the same guy, the same, uh, and uh, this is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a sense, in a sense, but maybe it's not, you know, answering strictly to the to the conspiracy and how it's kind of have this kind of theological uh, aspects, uh, but it certainly does. I mean, it certainly, it certainly you know, supplants or. Are there other questions? I get how you connect paranoia, conspiracy theory with atheism, because these three post-socialist uh, states kind of have this gap which is filled with all sorts of like extra sense and supernatural people, etc., etc. But uh, there is definitely, it's more of a comment, it's not a question, there's definitely a rise of, uh, it's some sort of something like a post-New Age or late New Age, because it's true that in our generations, in Bulgaria I can confirm as well, it's full of all sorts of very weird theories, People who were educated claim that the pyramids have alien ships inside and stuff like this. So there's definitely some hype of, uh, how do you call this, uh, zero department material, paranoia, conspiracy. It's very interesting how you pay attention to this in this creative and interactive way. But how is this, so are you claiming that this uh, conspiracy, mind, conspiracy mindset is related to science fiction? Does it feel in science fiction? And I understand how we align paranoia and conspiracy with atheism, but do we align to science fiction and do we have actors who are represented for this? Yeah, the thing is that they are denying this kind of connection. I mean, uh, but this is already suspicious, right? Uh, because they, they always say, uh, we don't, we, uh, you know, but a lot of these uh, people, there are members or kind of gravitating around sci-fi fan clubs. So, but they, they emphasize their kind of real identity in a sense. I mean, this kind of, uh, I don't know, that they were ex-military. They, they're quite open uh, about this kind of thing, but not saying how they got, or what books they read, or never making transparent a kind of uh, science fiction or story. And I had this, I was kind of also submerged, I must say, I wasn't, I mean, I had friends who were writing into science fiction magazines from, you know, being in the clubs from the high school uh, and full into it. Uh, and I'm, I sort of gravitated into the clubs and being a sort of also, I don't know, like a hybrid there in, a, in, a, in, a, in these clubs. And uh, I witnessed all sorts of like interesting sociological kind of aspects. And there were these guys coming, you know, like dressed up really like smart and with some kind of nice uh, suitcase and so on. And just coming to, sorry, can I say something? And just blurbing and saying, uh, it's like, uh, you know, how to tell you about God and so on. And uh, it's like a battery and you recharge and so on. But really like, and there were members of this I mean, they were kind of, you know, almost like secret handshakes with uh, uh, with these kind of groups inside the, uh, you know. So they always uh, this kind of. So 
Mediterranean or kind of networking going on, which you are very familiar, I'm sure, also sure. It's not exactly a question what I have, but there was just something which happened during the previous panel, which is as if for the spot. I mean, it's exactly on the spot. There was apparently a member of the Zero Department that commented <laughs> under the live stream of our uh, of our conference. I mean, he was way more hardcore than you guys, but he basically started with the claim that sci-fi is pointless and it should be prohibited because it just supports the lie that the Earth is round because the earth is actually flat, and there is a dome on it, and that he went as far as to say that the wind only blows from the east, and I wanted to ask if any of you was really were really that person that I was talking to during the previous panel. <laughs> the name of the guy is Mr. Aubrey, so if you, if you if you'd like to follow the link that the Theodora sent before the, 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 the beginning of the conference, you can just see how the whole discussion went. We will filter it down and see if it passes by and then we will follow the link. We cannot disclose more. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good one.